Welcome to The Real News. I'm Kim Brown. At the 92nd Annual Academy Awards show that aired Sunday, the film Parasite became the first foreign language film ever to win the Oscar for Best Picture. The film simply cleaned up, picking up the best original screenplay and the erudite director Bong Joon-ho won the Oscar for Best Director. Spoiler alert! It is first and foremost about segregation by class between the elites and everyone else in South Korea. But it's also about climate change and those who will bear the brunt of it on the front lines, a topic that makes a key twist in the movie's plot about halfway through the film. As The Real News climate reporter alumnus Darna Noor wrote for the publication Earther, Parasite is not only the first foreign language film to win one of the industry's most hallowed prizes, it is also the first Best Picture winner to zoom in on the societal impacts of the climate crisis. Now joining us to talk about it is Dr. Min Song, who wrote a piece for the Chicago Review of Books titled Climate Change in the Film Parasite, an ecological look at Bong Joon-ho's new film. Dr. Song is a professor in the English department at Boston College. He also directs the school's Asian American Studies program. He's the former editor of the Journal of Asian American Studies, and he's the author of the forthcoming book titled Climate Lyricism. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Song. Thank you for having me. So again, if you're watching, spoiler alert. Now, that said, Dr. Song, do us a favor and summarize your piece for us in any thinking that you've done on the topic since, because, you know, how and why is Parasite a film about the climate crisis? Okay, so uh, it never actually mentions climate change or global warming anywhere in the film, but it does if you're paying attention for it, really come across very strongly. Uh, it starts uh, really about halfway through the film. It carefully sets up the story where these uh, very poor working class people uh, find a way to get jobs working for this very wealthy family. And halfway through the film, uh, the, the family, the wealthy family go away on a camping vacation. And uh, the, this poor family, the Kims, uh, get to just take it easy and kind of celebrate what they have. And they've just kind of camped out in the house. Uh, of course, this huge rain happens at this point. And this is where I think climate change really starts to figure in. Not so much saying, here's um, an example of climate change, as much as here's an effect of what happens when the weather gets really extreme. Uh, the wealthy people have to come back. Uh, from their camping trip because they're almost washed away. Uh, and for them, it's just a minor annoyance. Uh, but for this family who have to scramble to escape, uh, you, you, there's this really, I think, amazing dramatic scene. It's such a dramatic moment in the film to see the difference between these very wealthy people who live on top of a hill for whom this unusually extreme weather uh, is just an annoyance and this working class family who loses everything uh, and ends up in a gymnasium that's made into a kind of temporary shelter. And in that way, I think the film does just a really brilliant job of dramatizing for viewers how the effects of extreme weather is being lived right now. And I don't mean in the future, but I mean right now. Uh, all over the world, uh, in low-lying areas where poor people live, uh, they live in very similar circumstances. Uh, and uh, extreme weather, like just not even like a hurricane, but just a heavy downpour, can be ruinous for people who live in these areas. Clearly, the climate crisis is not being felt equally. It's not being shared equally uh, amongst people of, of differing classes. In this film, Parasite, class is really integral to the plot of the film. So how these interconnected issues, how do you think they were conveyed by the director, Jun Ho? So I think the, the film does just a really great job of conveying the, the sense in which like the wealthy people are sheltered. They're literally living on a hill. 
the poor people who live below, they're always associated with the ground, the earth. Uh, a lot is made about their smell. So there's definitely a sharp class distinction being made. And I think there's two important parts to this film that we need to keep in mind when we're talking about class. The, the first part is uh, that the wealthy family are not evil characters. They aren't going out of their way to mistreat their workers. And in fact, they treat their workers as well as one could in those situations. It's uh, it's clear that they pay them pretty well and they take care of them. They, they boss them around and, and just kind of, you know, basically they're expected to be there and be invisible. Uh, and they also do say sort of obnoxious things about their smell later in the film. Uh, but the people themselves aren't, uh, notably like evil characters. They're just really normal, ordinary kind of people. And in some ways, the problem that the wealthy family have in the film is that they're ordinary and they really want to believe that they are more than that, that they are like extraordinary people. Uh, the mother is desperate to believe, for instance, that her son has artistic talent or that her daughter uh, is going to be a really stellar student. And it's clear throughout the film that the son probably doesn't have a whole lot of artistic skill and that that the daughter um, isn't isn't going to be a great student. Uh, the other thing that the film does with class that's really interesting is that uh, in order for the Park family to get the positions that they get in this wealthy household, they have to push out another woman who's working there as a maid. And the film becomes also a conflict between working class people. So one of the challenges for the characters in the film uh, is not so much like overcoming the resistance of the wealthy people in terms of giving them uh, or valuing their labor properly, as much as it is also about the difficulties of creating solidarity within working class people, that, that they are fighting each other for what are really scraps or you know really menial jobs. Uh, and so the film is also about the the, the incredible difficulty of uh, of people who are in very similar socioeconomic positions uh, finding solidarity with one another. More often than not in the film, what's shown is that they are in fierce competition uh, and constantly undermining. Dr. Song, there's also some Native American imagery at the center of many key scenes in the movie. So what did you make of that in a film mostly about South Korea? And what do you think Parasite is conveying there with regards to the United States and its indigenous population? That's a, that's a really great question. And I've been mulling it since I've seen the film. I've been trying to figure out what the Native American imagery is doing. On the one hand, I think it's extremely important to be careful about such imagery. It just gets so abused and so, um, uh, you know, and, and Native American headdresses and figures get uh, get used as ornaments all the time in, in, I think, extremely troubling ways. And the film may be doing that. And it's certainly something to keep in mind when you're watching the film and really thinking about what the imagery means. Uh, and I don't want to at all suggest that we should dismiss that possibility. Uh, my own sense of the film was that it, it really wanted to create um, a, a that it's meant to show something about the about the wealthy family that they um, are oblivious to how offensive the that that use of Indian headdresses and tomahawks and teepees are that they they see that as just a kind of like fun affectation or you know like just you know uh, entertainment uh, and they they are oblivious to the controversy around it so if that's the point of the film I think it's a really extraordinary thing that it's meant for a Korean audience first, and that a Korean audience then is being expected to understand how messed up the Native American imagery is, and that they are supposed to understand that this is does not say nice things about the wealthy family, that they are people who don't understand uh, or are insensitive to these kinds of issues. Uh, and, and if that's the case, I think it's actually quite an extraordinary move in the film in the ways in which it assumes its audience knows the stuff and uh, is sophisticated about understanding the place of Native Americans in U.S. racial politics. Dr. Song, 
You teach classes on climate change in literature, but it's also becoming increasingly popular as a film topic. Paul Schrader's recent film, First Reformed, nominated for Best Original Screenplay in 2019, it comes to mind. So talk to us about the importance of pop culture books and film in particular in conveying the urgency of the climate crisis in a way that reaches new audiences. Yeah, so I, I think uh, it's obviously important. Uh, the, the ways in which it's important, though, I think it really needs to be thought carefully about. Uh, on the one hand, we do have a lot of very popular narratives in TV shows and movies and novels and comic books even uh, that show uh, people living under extreme weather conditions where their climate has changed. But it's often in places far away, like on another planet or in some future place, you know, like an apocalyptic narrative. Uh, sometimes it's caused by uh, by things like uh, a meteorite or uh, or uh, the the sun inexplicably expanding and heating up. There's all sorts of weird reasons why the climate changes in these films, and they're always seen as kind of fantastical moments. So we're quite comfortable actually with depictions of our planet uh, or a human inhabited planet becoming uninhabitable and then people struggling to survive on that planet. That's a, actually a very, very familiar story. Uh, but there's always a, what makes it entertainment in some ways is that it's so far away from us. It's so distant. Uh, so what's interesting about uh, a newer wave of stories, uh, films and movies and, and so on, uh, or films and novels and so on, is the ways in which the setting is not far away, but it's actually very close. And it's set in the present, not in the far future. And those those kinds of things are, are happening all around a very familiar landscape, which looks a lot like our own. And I think that's actually a really important move for narratives about climate change to make, to show, um, show like how people are struggling to survive in a world that's, um, already changing around them, uh, where extreme weather events are becoming more common, uh, where there are droughts and fires, uh, and and that, 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 that fiction in some ways is already reflecting uh, um, a landscape that is our landscape. Uh, and those are the kind of narratives I think we need more of, and we're starting to get them. Uh, and, and, and in some ways, what's happened, I think, though, is that narratives, have kind of lagged behind what's actually happening in the world around us. So, uh, you know, it's been true for a long time, uh, at least uh, in my memory, I think that one, one extreme other event that really sticks out to me is Hurricane Katrina. I remember very vividly watching it on TV and thinking, wow, this is like a movie. Uh, uh, but movies themselves haven't really been able to show how those events are connected to climate change and how people are living that kind of reality until more recently. And I think that's um, maybe a reflection of that lag that, that's happening in literature. We've been speaking with Dr. Min Song, who is a professor in the English department at Boston College. He also directs the school's Asian American Studies program. He's working on a new book titled Climate lyricism. Dr. Song, we do appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for watching The Real News. Thanks a lot for watching. Appreciate it. Uh, but do us one more solemn favor. Hit the subscribe button below. You know you want to. Stay up on the videos.